So she walks over to pick up Fluffy and down she goes into the sewage tank. But Haggai brings this message to the people. Of course, they're scattered out. He bring, they bring them all in for this message. They hear this message. And, and Haggai does something that good preachers do. Good preachers ask questions. And so in order for them to understand the message of Haggai, God had Haggai ask two critical questions of the priests. So in verse 10, we, we see this, and in verse, uh, to begin the message, and then in verse 12, he asks this question. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with this fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And you're going, what is that all about? Right? Well, oftentimes, what people did after their sacrifice, they would carry some of that sacrifice with them, thinking almost like it was a lucky charm, that whatever was in the fold of their garment and they touched it, it would become holy. See the, the issue there, right? I mean, the question for us might be, does holiness happen by contact? Does it happen by eating holy meat? Does that make you holy? Does religious traditions or rituals of some kind make you holy? Right? Does church attendance make you holy? Does growing up in a Christian family make you holy or a Christian? Does being part of a denomination make you holy. I've had many conversations in our community and people, as I talk with them and then we, I, I get opportunities to share the gospel, they go, oh, I belong to such and such a denomination. I said, well, do you go to church at all? Well, no, 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 I quit years ago. But I was baptized as an infant in it, so I guess I'm in, right? No, that's a ritual. Rituals don't make us Holy. So does holiness happen by contact? The principle is very clear. Holiness does not come by contact or function. Right? See, true spirituality is through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ that results in walking through the power of the Spirit of God in obedience and submission to God, our Father's plan in our life. Okay? That's in the notes as well. But here, Haggai wants to be clear to the people. For some of them, they thought that if they could just touch someone. Years ago, I was at a conference where Chuck Swindoll, of all people, was preaching. I got there early with my friend. And I said to my friend, you know what? I'm going to touch Chuck Swindoll today. Second row, he's sitting in the front row. They bring him in, and I just touched him on the shoulder, and I said, Dr. Swindoll, it's so good to see you today. God bless you as you preach today. Did I get zapped by Chuck Swindoll? No. Nothing really changed, right? But just because I touched someone, a religious leader, or they touched me, doesn't make me holy. All right. So he wants to help us to understand a number of things here very clearly. See, what was happening amongst the people was what Jesus was saying in Matthew 15. That these people honored me with my, their lips, but their hearts were far from me. So they might have even walked by the foundation of the temple. It's, God, thank you for the foundation being in. And they just continued on in their life. They honored God with their lips, but their hearts and their actions have taken a vacation away from God. And that's what Haggai's helping them understand. Even though they're starting to rebuild the temple, right? Their hearts were not right with God. They might have been going through the labor of it. They might have just been hanging out with some of the priests at the services, 
but their hearts were not in it. So look at verse 13. He asks the next question. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answers and said, it does become unclean. Okay. What's clean and what's unclean, right? I mean, does sinful defilement happen by contact? Yes. Years ago, I had a friend. He used to drive this incredible truck that basically sucked sewage out of people's tanks at their house. You know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? Some of you in the city have no idea what I'm talking about. Right? And he drove this sewage truck. So he got a call one night, really late, on a Saturday night, and he goes over to this house. What had happened that night, let's just call the lady Mrs. Jones. All right? And this is in an older home in the city of Vancouver, where they, they had the, these holding tanks and houses. They didn't have, a, a, you know, because there were bigger lots than that, they, they just weren't hooked up to the city sewage system. So they had to have tanks pumped out. But the people that bought this house had no idea that was happening. Okay? So Mrs. Jones walks out one night, lets her do little dog out. Let's call him Fluffy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Fluffy goes out in the yard, kind of in the first week, and she can't see Fluffy in the yard. But she sees Fluffy just sitting out on this flat piece in the yard. So she walks over to pick up Fluffy, and down she goes into the sewage tank, the septic tank, okay? Her husband heard her yelling. She threw Fluffy out, because it wasn't that deep, and my friend got the call. They had no idea that their, their house was on this septic system, but in an old Vancouver, what they used to do, instead of having a concrete cover, they would put thick planks over it so the grass would grow nicely. And it did. But the planks rotted out. So as she fell in, let me ask you this. Was she clean or unclean? <laughs> did everybody get that one? What she touched was unclean. Right? And her poor husband had to make sure that there was a concrete top on it from then on. And so Mrs. Jones and you know her dog could walk on it easily. In the example that Haggai uses, in the law, touching a dead body made you unclean. So there was ceremonial washing and all that to, to take that away. You see, sin is unclean. Breaking the Ten Commandments makes us unclean. Cheating on a husband or cheating on a wife makes things unclean. Lying or stealing makes things unclean. Look at, go back, and um, Ed, Learn, Ed Learn was watching me this morning, and he says, are you changing your sermon today? Because I was writing a lot of notes in my notes. And uh, yeah, I told him, I said, I'm not... God's not ended speaking to me about this. So, but if you go to Psalm 66, here's one of my inclusions in the message. How's that? Psalm 66 says, If I have cherished iniquity in my heart, verse 18, the Lord would not have listened. Okay? Just take that for a moment. But truly God has listened and has attended to the voice of my prayer. Right? You see, sin defiles us. See, disobedience with the people caused God's blessings to be withheld. But then obedience, when they repented of their sin, had short accounts with God, didn't let anything build up between themselves and God. God caused blessings to be, be released. It's interesting that in Corinthians, 
God gets very specific about this in a number of places. It's an interesting book to study, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Because he says their bad company corrupts good character. And, and, and so what was happening likely is that people said, you know, it's not time right now to build the temple. And that, that rumor and that, 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 that sinful talk was just kind of spreading through everybody. Because sin is contagious, holiness is not. Holiness is not. And it's true that their rituals could not save them. There are clean things and, and holy things as we understand it, right? And, and there's, this, there's this illustration from the Old Testament in Joshua uh, 6 and 7 where God's people go and they go and they, they see the fall of Jericho. They listen to God, they obey God, but they are warned, don't take anything from that particular city for yourself. And so what happens, a guy does. His name is Achar, or some of us might know him as Achan. And he takes certain things from the spoils of that city. He takes them and he puts them in his tent. He buries them, right? And then the people of God go out again and they are defeated at Ai and Joshua is inquiring of God, what is going on? You promised us that we would deal with our enemies. But God says, no, there's something going on. And so they bring them out tribe by tribe. Like it's, it's an incredible scene when you see this and it gets right down to Achan and his family and, and Joshua says to him, give glory to God and repent. And he owes up to it, brings it out, and God takes Achan and his whole family out. Do not think for a moment that that's just Old Testament. Do not think for a moment that your leadership within your home doesn't impact your family. Are you moving them to the things of God or away from the things of God? That's what Achan did. We live in a wicked world and sin spreads like cancer. And the defilement of the heart defiles the work of our hands. That's the message that Haggai wants us to understand. See, holiness takes transformation through Christ and time to go. And if you go back to this passage in, in Haggai, you see this, right? And then he says, so it is with these people, right? They've been touching unclean things. They've allowed unclean things into their home. They've allowed unclean things into their life. So he says, this is what's happened. And with this whole nation, declares the Lord. And so with every worker of their hands, notice that. Because their hearts are away from God, the work of their hands is stalled, you might say, and unblessed. It's a hard deal here. And what they offer has been, as a result, unclean. 